Hello and welcome to a lecture recital by Confluence Concerts Young Associate Artist Ryan McDonald entitled Will They Ever Know Me? Celebrating the 1980s pop icon countertenor Klaus Nomi. My name is Larry Beckwith and I'm the artistic producer of Confluence Concerts. We are recording this event at the wonderful 21 Shaftesbury Avenue venue in the heart of downtown Toronto and are eternally grateful to our hosts and sponsors here Vern and Elfrida Heinrichs and Marina Unger, longtime friends and supporters of Confluence. I invite you to visit our website at confluenceconcerts.ca for information on upcoming events of ours as we near the end of this unique and hybrid 2021-2022 season. We are tremendously grateful to the Canada Council for the Arts, the Ontario and Toronto Arts Councils, and of all of our members, sponsors, and donors who have sustained us through the darkest and most isolating days of the pandemic. Your support has truly made all the difference. Countertenor Ryan McDonald is a current young artist with Pacific Opera Victoria's Civic Engagement Quartet, a recent Encouragement Award winner from the Metropolitan Opera National Council audition. Ryan McDonald has been seen on stage as Athamas in Handel Semele, First Witch and Spirit in Purcell's Dido and Aeneas, L'Enfant in Ravel's L'Enfant et les Sortilèges, Cupid in John Blow's Venus and Adonis, and Jack in Sondheim's Into the Woods. Ryan was hailed by Opera Canada for his performance in Dido and Aeneas. Ryan is the co-founder of Opera Q, a company focused specifically on presenting queer theater by queer artists for queer audiences. And don't miss Medusa's Children, premiering online June 3rd. For more information and for tickets to that, you can visit operaqto.com. Ryan led the reimagined production of Purcell's Dido and Belinda as the titular character Dido for Opera Q. In addition to their performing activities, Ryan is currently pursuing a DMA in historical performance at the University of Toronto, where they are researching the life of Klaus Nomi and investigating the ever-expanding queer performance practice, part of which will be covered in this fascinating presentation. We are grateful to pianist Ivan Jovanovich for his collaboration with Ryan. Please welcome Ryan McDonald.
It's newer than new, it's youer than you, it's wower than wow, and it's nower than now. And those were the fateful words spoken at the opening of the four-night New Wave Vaudeville Cabaret, where Klaus Nomi sang that very aria, and that marked the birth of the alien that we now know as Klaus Nomi. Um, he opened the evening that night uh, singing that very aria, and at first the audience started to laugh at him. And about halfway through, that turned to cheers where people were throwing drinks on the stage, throwing their shirts on the stage. They couldn't believe it. And no one believed that he was singing live, and he was asked to come back and sing that aria four more times that night. Um, so, there we go. So, Nomi has been the center of my artistic and scholarly practice for the last number of years. And before I begin tonight's presentation, um, I have to first talk about a challenge that I have faced. And that is that due to the historical practice of an ongoing erasure of queer history, we collectively have a fragmented access to our queer past. So this has posed a number of challenges for me as I attempt to research the life and the artistic practices of Nomi and attempt to construct an informed performance practice guide to Nomi's cabarets. The second problem I have faced uh, has been what exactly do classical music scholars deem worthy of documenting? So Nomi and his contemporaries have all but been left out of all historical research of, on New York City and its classical music scene from the 1970s and 80s. So this problem has required me to rely on proxy research. And this proxy research has included, uh, believe it or not, uh, YouTube comments, uh, Reddit chat rooms, uh, Facebook groups, uh, of trying to find comments from people who have saw Nomi perform and knew Nomi. But this has opened me up to uh, certainly a world of uh, research that I never would have thought to look for. And I love this quote from Klaus Nomi, and I think, uh, this really tells you everything you need to know about him and his performance, uh, his performance style, that Elvis Presley is my spiritual father, and as you may know, Maria Callas is my spiritual mother. So who exactly was Klaus Nomi? So Klaus Nomi, born Klaus Speber, was a countertenor born in Bavaria, Germany in 1944. Um, we don't know a whole lot about Klaus's upbringing, but we do know that he was exposed to music in school from a young age and he used to actually work as an usher at the Deutsche Opera in West Berlin. And this is where he was introduced to opera. And Klaus was a very personable guy, and it is said that he made friends with all of the stagehands and a lot of the pit musicians. So after each performance, as he was going around and cleaning up the auditorium, he would actually go on stage, put on the costumes of the great divas of the opera, and perform the arias with some of his friends who were in the pit and with the help of the stagehands. Uh, he was also a regular at the gay discotheque Kleist Casino, where he would then go sing these opera arias. Um, and despite clearly receiving classical training as an adult, uh, there is very little known about who he trained with and whether that had been in New York City or whether that was in Germany. But what we can clearly tell from the very beginning is that Klaus had an affinity for mixing classical music with popular culture. So Nomi then moves to New York City in 1972, and his first appearance in the cabaret scene was in a satirical camp version of Das Rheingold that was staged by Charlie Ludlum. And uh, in 1978, Nomi rose to prominence uh, after performing, as I had mentioned, that very aria at the four-night New Wave vaudeville. Um, after this performance, he becomes a regular at all the hottest clubs in New York City. He premieres, uh, performs at clubs like Club 57, the Mud Club, and the Pyramid Club. Um, and it is actually here uh, that he draws the attention of one David Bowie. And uh, so David Bowie was totally enthralled with who Klaus Nomi was. And he asked him to sing backup for him during Bowie's very famous SNL performance in, in 1979. You can see Klaus just there behind David. And David, of course, wearing Klaus's signature sort of sharp-shouldered tuxedo. Uh, and this really solidified Nomi as sort of a, a cult status icon and a celebrity in the New York City nightlife scene. Uh, and Nomi from there went on to be an arranger and a composer for David Bowie. Uh, so Nomi released two successful albums that were largely in the new wave genre, but these albums did feature a mix of classical, popular, uh, and original music. 
and he remained a mainstay, gaining a cult following known as the Nomis, until his death from complications due to HIV AIDS in 1983. And as Andy Warhol in, in the Village Voice is noted, that Nomi was the first major celebrity to die of HIV AIDS. Um, and as you can see, though, to talk about what a bright star Nomi was and how quickly he seemed to burn out, that by 1994, he'd almost largely been forgotten, as Attitude Magazine says, as they called for a renewed attention to his works. So, of course, Nomi is unique, but what exactly makes him unique? So I have sort of identified, I think, a couple of different uh, aspects of his performances. So he is still considered uh, to be the king of new wave, uh, the queerest rocker to ever live, as noted in the Village Voice. And Nomi understood the roots of punk and new wave, and he really embodied that spirit both on and off stage. Um, he was most certainly a genre defier, so Nomi fused classical music, popular music, classical instruments with, you know, what was considered to be the cutting edge technology of that time. Uh, but he would perform uh, Dowland songs with a, a fax machine as accompaniment. And um, Nomi was particularly obsessed with amplification and exactly the way that he was miked and how the instruments were miked and what those levels looked like. Um, he was also a collaborative creature, and um, one thing about Nomi's performances is that while his cabarets would sometimes include only five or six pieces, they could last for hours because he was hyper-focused on each number. So each number had brand new makeup, costumes, choreography, lighting, set design, um, and so, but he could not do this on his own, and so because of this, uh, he relied so much on costumers, lighting designers, musical directors, um, and he was a real champion of the visual arts, and two artists in particular uh, who he really championed were Keith Haring and Basquiat, and he used to bring them on stage to paint while he sang. Um, of course, in 2017, uh, Basquiat's work Untitled sold for $110.5 million, uh, which is the highest uh, auction record for an American artist. So it's just to say, uh, Clefs clearly had an eye for talent from the very beginning. Um, and I really think of Klaus as an outsider to outsiders. So for as wild as New York City was in the late 1970s and early 1980s, no one was really doing what Klaus Nomi was doing. Um, he was too punk for the establishment, but his reliance on classical music and his devotion to the canon uh, often made him far too establishment uh, for the punks. Um, and something that we, you know, with hindsight, have now really understood about Nomi's works is this idea of the dis distancing effect. And this is a term that was coined by Bertolt Brecht, um, who in the classical music world, maybe we know most well uh, for creating the Three Penny Opera with Kurt Weill, uh, but he was a director and a theater creator, and Brecht believed in drawing attention to the artifice of a performance through heightening certain elements in order to better put forth his ideas. He wanted to alienate the audience so they could think critically about the play and its subject matter. So this is really one of the ideas that Nomi incorporated into his work, uh, and this was achieved by stripping the event uh, of its self-evident, familiar, obvious quality and creating a sense of astonishment and curiosity about the performer. Um, but to understand exactly what Nomi was doing and how he was perceived, uh, I think it's important that we understand the world in which Nomi was operating in. Um, and so, at first, I just want to talk a little bit about what I'm calling the underground world, or sort of the, uh, the scene that Nomi would have been most known in. So Christian Hoffman, who was Klaus Nomi's longtime artistic collaborator, uh, he was his musical director, oftentimes a ranger. So Christian Hoffman notes that the underground club scene featured people who were charming, presenting a punk version of Mickey Rooney, goofy, anti-establishment, outside theater kids. And Klaus took himself and his work very seriously, and people would laugh it off, not knowing what they were seeing. To be so meticulous and care about performance and look was very uncool, and like you were giving in to the man. Yet, these punk audiences were transfixed. So it's just to say Nomi was really operating in two worlds at the time, uh, but couldn't seem to be accepted by any. Um, so the classical music world of New York City of the 1970s. We have the arrival of James Levine at the Metropolitan Opera. He really transforms the Met Orchestra and the chorus into top performers. 
And the way that he did this was by going back to the standards. James Levine felt that the company as a whole had moved too far from the classic canon. And uh, he was obsessed with fostering a new generation of American opera stars and really focusing on the voice. Um, of course, Levine was extremely successful in this and the Met Opera uh, Orchestra and Chorus uh, you know, ended up becoming a huge touring ensemble as well and plus are, are you know, now one of the biggest opera producers in the world. At the same time, we have Pierre Boulez. He becomes the music director of the New York Philharmonic. Um, and he also brought the New York Philharmonic really back to its international reign. This was partly through the Emmy-winning program live from Lincoln Center, but again, it was a reliance on the standard repertoire, um, something that Nomi was not necessarily fond of. Um, in addition, Nomi was operating within the queer world of the 1970s in New York. So we now know 1969, uh, the very famous stain Stonewall in Raid and Riots. And in 1972, we have the first publication of a religious organization accepting bisexual people. At the same time, we have the rise and really deification of characters like Andy Warhol. We also see the very first pride parade in New York City. Um, we see the rise and popularity of the ball scene and culture. Uh, the formation of the club kids, uh, the rise of stars like RuPaul, Lady Bunny, Suzanne Barge, Amanda Lepore, Lee Bowery, who are now, many of them, have become household names. Um, but it's important to note that the AIDS epidemic is really what brought these disparate queer groups together. So while Klaus was operating, the queer scene was still largely separated into very small sort of collectives, uh, and Klaus couldn't seem to really find his place anywhere. Um, so I want to talk a little bit more about exactly what made Nomi's cabarets so unique. Um, the first thing would be the vocalization. So Nomi sang in a traditional countertenor range, which mimics that of a contralto or a mezzo-soprano. Um, and so while the early music uh, revival began in the 50s, it was certainly firmly established by the 1970s. And Alfred Deller, of course a, uh, another alien in his, in his own right, but a countertenor, was a huge part of this. Um, but it wasn't until 1971 did James Bowman, another very famous countertenor, appear at the Glyndebourne Opera, and he was actually the first countertenor to do so. So had Nomi even been interested in exploring a strictly classical path, that path was not yet really paved for one to do that. Um, he, uh, he, so the genre, I, I have already sort of mentioned that he can't really fit into one genre, but he had a great love for early music, for 19th century opera, but also for popular music. Um, he would perform mashos, uh, mashups of Dido's Lament and Ding Dong, The Witch is Dead. Um, one of his standards was You Don't Own Me by Leslie Gore. He would sing The Twist, uh, Lou Christie's Lightning Striked. Uh, but he also performed an enormous amount of Purcell, Dowland, and Schumann. And so I think while the popular music spoke to his punk aesthetic, uh, I think the drama that is found in the storytelling of classical music uh, is certainly what spoke to the more dramatic side of Nomi. Um, in addition, it was his use of instrumentation. I already mentioned a little bit uh, about that, but he would use everything from period instruments, harpsichord, full orchestras, to synthesizers. Uh, he has a very famous recording of singing Dowland's Flow My Tears with the accompaniment of a theremin, um, an electric guitar. Um, and he was a songwriter for so many punk bands, uh, along with his collaborator, Christian Hoffman. Um, and so they also performed an enormous amount of original music, and they were really able to craft these mashups themselves. So what I'd like to do now is sing another couple of songs. And uh, while they may not be um, you know, with a fax machine today, um, there are three songs that Nomi has recorded and loved to perform. Uh, the first is Come Again, Sweet Love, uh, from Dowland's first book of songs, A Der Nussbaum, uh, from Schumann's uh, Myrtenlieder, and then Music for a While. And um, I think that these three songs really show sort of the beauty and the flexibility of the countertenor voice. Um, and I think you can imagine, um, you know, sort of at three o'clock in the morning, and uh, Nomi performing these uh, in some underground club scene and what sort of reaction uh, he would have got from the audience. So. Thank you. Oh, 
So this evening we've heard a lot about who Klaus Nomi was, and you've heard a little bit about the types of music that Klaus Nomi liked to perform. Um, but I'd like to, just for a minute, uh, show you, I think, a little bit of what Nomi's legacy is, and certainly I think what Nomi's legacy could be uh, on both the classical music and the queer world. Um, and it does beg the question of where are we now? So queer people are certainly not new to classical music, but having our stories told using the art form is. There has been an explosion of queer-centered works over the last decade, and while this has liberated queer artists, I also believe that it has given presenters new audiences and has pushed the sonic possibilities for classical music uh, in a way that we haven't seen. Uh, we see acts now such as Thorgy Thor and the Thorchestra. Thorgy Thor, a very wonderful drag queen and violinist uh, who had, travels around with their orchestra performing all of the greatest hits. Um, things like the Kingster Fetish Festival in Berlin. And I would love to read you uh, just a small excerpt of a review from that night. A hush fell over the hundreds of Kingsters gathered in the pews of the Twelve Apostles Church in Berlin when the cellist, clad in head-to-toe black leather, took a seat in the front row of the altar and began to play Rachmaninoff. At the back of the room, ushers from the nun-themed drag troupe, the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence, watched him rapt. When the cellist was done, a leather-clad organist played Bach's Prelude in C major. He was followed by a quartet in chest harnesses and leather pants who performed Vivaldi's Sonata in A minor. Then a towering baritone in skin-tight leather sang the hymn Panis Angelicus to cheers from the crowd. So I think, my gosh, if only Klaus Nomi had been alive to see how far we've come with events like that. But even here in our very own city, we have seen so many queer-centered works. Uh, we have the COC's production of Hadrian. Um, we, of course, have uh, my own ensemble, uh, Opera Q. Uh, we have works from Against the Grain, uh, Bound, which is featuring a trans soprano brand, St. Clair, Taya Kasahara's The Queen and Me. Um, productions from composers like Olga Neuwirth at the Vienna Staats Opera, featuring, featuring an entire trans cast. Uh, was supposed to open just before the pandemic, but like so many things, has been delayed. Um, <clears throat> And uh, just at POV, uh, they uh, just put on a Don Giovanni, and that was supposed to star trans baritone Lucia Lucas. Um, and so I think what all of this shows us is that the renaissance of queer music will include uh, queer artists. Um, and to get a little more specific, just to show you, I think, some of the direct parallels that we see between Klaus Nomi and the classical music world. His legacy has left a lasting influence on popular culture, and we continue to see, continue to see his genius referenced today. Uh, the first image there is uh, Anthony Roth Costanza, uh, an amazing countertenor, and Justin Vivian Bond, who uh, you may have seen on and off Broadway and is an unbelievable cabaret performer, just released an album only an octave apart, uh, and I think this probably more than any other album uh, has taken a page right out of Nomi's book. Uh, it is 
so wonderfully camp and you know they pay such reverence to classical music popular music musical theater fusing all of those works together uh, and as they say only an octave apart between an amazing trans baritone and an amazing countertenor um, just in the middle there I mean we see Nomi referenced all the time in queer culture I mean there's a, a still from the you know hit show RuPaul's Drag Race and uh, Nomi is sort of a regular reference on that show uh, and if anyone has recently caught the Warhol diaries that were uploaded on Netflix uh, Klaus Nomi makes a brief appearance uh, you can actually hear a recording of Andy Warhol uh, talking about Klaus who is just off camera um, and in this last photo here, um, how Klaus Nomi has made it into mainstream culture, uh, we have two photos here from the Met Gala, which is fashion and Hollywood's biggest night. Um, on the right, we have uh, Natasha Lyonne, who uh, said that Klaus Nomi inspired their outfit for the 2019 gala, which was themed camp. But also, of course, we have Rihanna clearly referencing Klaus Nomi's tuxedo. Uh, for the 2009 Met Gala theme, which was model as muse embodying fashion. Uh, and I think no one saw themselves a bigger muse of themselves than Klaus Nomi, and so I think what a brilliant reference. Um, so what does that mean for us looking ahead? Well, queer people have always fostered cultural innovation, whether it be through language, fashion, music, dance, writing. And many creations by queer people have become so entranced in society that I think queer people themselves sometimes do not even recognize these contributions as being uniquely queer. And if you take anything away from tonight, I'm not suggesting that Klaus Nomi is the figure in queer classical music, uh, or even that his works were genuinely innovative. But he was a product of his experiences in the queer New York City scene of the 1970s. And rather, Nomi's combination of musical elements, cultural references, undoubtedly contribute to the ongoing and ever-evolving queer performance practice of classical music. And I think understanding artists like Nomi will strengthen our current practices and they will support queer musicians to foster, I think, genuinely innovative queer works in the future. Uh, innovative performances, I think, as we all know, do not happen overnight. Um, but I do feel obliged to do my part to empower performers who are seeking but rarely accessing space for themselves to empower queer audiences and performers alike. In turn, I hope that my work will inspire queer classical musicians to explore our collective queer history, center the many forgotten names and stories, and embrace our queer ancestors as a resource to further our fight for equity and I think to use it as a tool to usher in the renaissance of classical music. Thank you. Before, and I'm not gonna tell you too much about our final selection, I think I'll just let it speak for itself, but um, I, before we finish, I just wanna say a huge thank you to Larry and Jennifer and Confluence Concerts for giving me this opportunity this year and encouraging me, supporting me to do my very first lecture recital, so thank you all for being the audience for that. Um, and I wanna thank so much again the Heinrichs for being so generous and for providing us this space and the space afterwards. Um, and of course to Yvonne, who has been a, an amazing collaborator for so many years with me and is always so encouraging. So uh, I guess without further ado, uh, Yvonne and I are going to perform for you Dido slash Dido's Lament.
Flag upon my door. 